for them. Um, welcome everybody and sorry for waiting us in the waiting room. Uh, today we have a special guest. I'm super excited about this episode because I know Gaetano for years. I've been following him on LinkedIn since he was with P of Marketing at Sales Hacker. And he was our guest number three on this podcast. That time we had really great convo about his case study about growing the traffic and basically the entire dimension strategy of Sales Hacker. Since that time, he had a fantastic career journey and fastest growing companies, Outreach.io, Aura, Nextiva, and now making a huge move towards consulting business, starting advisory, and so currently he is a cross advisor at Cognism and Alice, two well-known B2B tech companies. Today we are going, as I said, today we are going to discuss old versus modern B2B demand gen. But before we'll start, guys, let me know, please, where you guys all coming from. I'm calling from Split, Croatia. Gee, I believe you are coming from Miami, right? Or where you are now? <laughs> yeah, uh, calling in from Miami, Florida. Um, I, and I still owe you a trip to, to Croatia, man. And that, that will be next year, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for you. So where you guys are coming from? Slovenia, my neighbors, uh, Canada, Amsterdam, uh, Belgium. I know lots of Benelux folks uh, should join today. New York, Boston, Michigan, United States. So we have a perfect time right now for our North Americans. Berlin, New York, Ukraine. Good to see you guys. Portland, North Dakota, Ukraine. Yeah, love to see our fellow Ukrainians on the podcast. India, nice. So we have, again, international audience should have a really good convo. So I believe we can kick it off, you know, with one simple question that will lead our conversation today. So how to run demand gen in 2023 and what should you stop doing? Man, that is a huge opening uh, remark. Wow. <laughs> well. Um... You know, maybe maybe uh, we can dissect the maybe the post that I created. That um, it it was the post that uh, you saw, Andre, and I think it's why we are even doing this uh, right now. So maybe I will post that in the chat, and we can just start to look at that one. And what do yeah, you say? Absolutely. All right, guys. So this this is the this is the post that um, it it created a lot of spark. A uh, lot of, uh, I would say, some some controversy. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right. So because this is such a huge, broad question, and there's, I don't want to ramble, I figured maybe I'll just share this to um, guide my train of thought as I talk through it. And, you know, we can go through these one by one. Maybe that would take a long time, or maybe we can just pick out a couple of them. So, um, <clears throat> Andre, do you want to maybe pick out a couple so we don't go through this huge list? What are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So let's look first of all at outdated B2B, right? Um, so months of planning and advance for campaigns. I totally agree with you. Just uh, discussions for the sake of discussions make no sense. Companies tend to waste time on this. It just make, make no sense. But I would love to hear your point. What do you mean by content calendar? So what's your point here? Yeah. <clears throat> so like what I have seen is that um, it makes marketing teams feel good knowing that they have a content plan, right? <clears throat> Nothing wrong with that. But if your content plan is more focused on deadlines and saying, you know, on Fridays, we're going to ship X, um, on Wednesdays, we're going to ship Y, what, what, I, what I tend to see happen more often than not is that they're too fixated on just shipping by a certain date. And, and it's called, I call this Asana check the box marketing syndrome where you say, yep, done, check. And you just kind of move on. 
And so uh, companies that, that are too fixated on this content calendar mindset, um, they, they, what I have found is that there's a correlation between companies that are using content calendars as like a way to measure their productivity versus do we even have the right content topics outlined? Um, what is the business value of the topics that we are um, putting out there? What are, what are the decisions being driven by? Is it being driven by keyword research or things we might have heard on customer calls or maybe customer feedback? Um, or is it just kind of just <laughs> some nebulous thing? I don't know, right? Um, and and one of the and the reason why I bring this up is because one of the main complaints I've been getting from like startup founders and CMOs lately is um, we're getting traffic, but I don't feel like it's relevant. We're targeting topics that are too far away from our product use cases. How do we balance the blend of educating in our content, but also showing how our product um, can help solve the problems that um, people are searching for and talking about? So basically, how do you blend um, not being too salesy versus being helpful? And I think companies really struggle with this in their content because I've either seen it too far one way or the other. I've seen it too far of like, this is just a thinly veiled product pitch, or this is like way too far away from being connected to our product use cases. So that 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 is a maybe a good point to open on, Andre. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to drop five cents. Uh, I had yesterday a conversation just uh, the let's say the initial engagement with a new client and we were discussing their demand gen strategy. And they shared with me one extremely valuable point that correlates with what you have said. So when they started demand generation, their key metric was the number of particles produced and ranking. And they are B2B service-based companies basically selling software development services. High ticket service, but at the same time, it's a commodity service. So the point is that uh, where this company ended up, they were regularly producing the content that is just focused on the keyword volume, right? They follow the keywords that potentially might be interested for CTOs. And it's all about, you know, how to create mobile app or whatever. But these articles add zero value. So where they ended up? Huge traffic, zero conversions, right? And that's exactly the point. Focus on the focus on the value you can add with the content. I I never love to brag, but still at our blog, we have six articles. Th these six articles generate around, I don't know, 3K monthly traffic to our website. But all of these articles convert. People come and say, hey, I read this ABMK study. I would love to talk to you guys how you can help to implement this. That's just the point. Not saying this to prag, but just to explain that quality never means, uh, quantity, <laughs> sorry, never means quality, right? Yes, um, yes. And, and Andre, maybe to uh, hammer this point one, one step further. I posted something in the chat that I think will be helpful for everybody that is doing content strategy for yeah. B2B. If you can scroll to the graphic below and just click on that. So this is the rubric that I have used uh, personally that I've created um, when I was working with Aura. This is a company that is in the identity theft protection space. And the rubric we came up with, and I borrowed this from Ahrefs, they have their own version, but I just, I tweak this to be more uh, relevant to what we are doing in identity theft. But one thing you guys can do is think about, not like Andre said, forget about the keyword volumes. Um, what you should look at more closely is how does this topic um, align to the problem we are solving and the use case for our product or service or solution? So if it is in a high score, like a three, that means your topic is um, something that your product is a critical solution for. So in this case, it was you know how to protect your child from identity theft, right? Um, going down the line, you can think about topics that are maybe more middle of funnel. Your product is helpful, but it's not the only essential solution to the problem. So things like that would be like, I got scammed on Facebook Marketplace. 
going further <laughs> away from the bottom of funnel is essentially things where uh, topics where you can only sparingly mention your product. So for example, how do scammers steal credit card numbers, right? There's a lot of ways this happens. The Aura solution can only be mentioned as one possible way to prevent this, but it's not the only possible way. And then of course, if you are in the zero, this is the extreme top of funnel. This is where your, your solution basically cannot be mentioned at all as a way to solve the problem, but it is a very, you know, trending topic with a lot of brand building potential. Um, it still may be worth doing some of this. I do believe you need a mix of all of it, but what I would suggest is thinking about an inverse demand gen funnel strategy where you nail the bottom of funnel topics and pages first, and then work your way up the funnel. You know, don't start by just doing a bunch of top of funnel stuff because then you're probably going to get questioned by your CMO or whoever is giving you budget to create content. They're going to say, yeah, we're getting traffic, but we're not seeing any kind of business outcome as a result of all this content creation. And so maybe we'll pause here and talk about this one as well, Andre. Yeah, absolutely. But what I'm clearly seeing here is the importance of customer interviews because these are the questions basically our customers are asking, right? So you don't just uh, pick up something from your head or do HRF's resource saying, hey, so this is a nice keyword. Let me write an article. So you pick up the real case, the real question, and just create content around it to help and then you just categorize this starting from our product is a critical solution. So you give just a step-by-step -step guide, right? We can call it whatever. Yeah, exactly. We got these content topics by listening to sales calls. So if you wouldn't be able to think of, I got scammed on Facebook marketplace as a topic by going to a keyword research tool. I mean, you might be able to, if you're really good at doing keyword research, but most people wouldn't find that. They What they would do is they would just type in something like identity theft or identity theft protection or identity theft tool, and then just see what kind of long tail gets spit out from that. And then just go and at attack those very obvious, but extremely competitive and difficult um, product focused keywords. And th the reality with those is you're gonna be fighting a really long time and you still may never make it into the results. And if you want to pay for those terms, you can, but it's expensive. So this is a way to work around all that. If you are an underdog company going up against very big brands and strong domains that have much more money than you and are much more well-known, you have to find the little pockets where you can win. And so by listening to sales calls and and you know, basically synthesizing customer insights, it's the best way to really develop your content strategy. Yeah, I love it. Um, so let's move to another bucket, employee advocacy on LinkedIn. So can you give just a few words here? Yeah, when, when th this happened, so I think for startups, this is not as uh, applicable, but as a company gets bigger, um, what you will eventually hear, if especially if you're like a VP of marketing or a director of marketing or even a director of demand gen, somebody from like HR or somebody from like corporate communications team will eventually message you and say, how can we get all of our employees more involved on LinkedIn and, and social? How can we get them to share more of our content? How can we get them to talk about our brand more? How can we get them to engage in brand storytelling on LinkedIn? How can we, how can we do that? And um, there are a lot of like tools out there that basically will just like provide companies with like lists of URLs from like the blog and just like automate, like schedule automated sharing on like LinkedIn and like, that's it. So the problem with it is that you, everyone knows that just sharing links don't go anywhere anymore. And really the bottom line is that um, you have to take your own like social media marketing into your own hands as a company. And you can't force employees who don't wanna do it to do it. You, so you have to find the, the people within the company that want to do this. And you have to basically come up with storytelling angles and narratives that can constantly be worked in um, on a regular basis to do better social media marketing um, from the 
perspective of the employee, but you have to give them the freedom to, to go and do that. It can't be a controlled thing. So the long story short here is that don't just blindly share links to your company blog articles because it won't get anywhere. You have to actually be more thoughtful around storytelling and narrative. Um, and it's not a lead gen thing. It's just staying top of mind and creating interesting and engaging threads. Uh, and ideally, your target audience will see it, click on it, you know, comment, engage, so forth. And this is how you build relationships over a long period of time. Thank you. So I think there are lots of points that uh, our community agrees with, like using gift and bribery and lead gen, right? Social display ads for lead gen, gated ebooks, sponsored conferences, trade shows, webinars for lead gen, sharing lead lists after webinars. So I totally agree with this. I believe, folks, uh, let, let me quickly ask you guys, do you believe that these tactics don't work anymore? So type yes or no in the Zoom chat and let's see what's your take. Should we give more points or more context about these points? Type yes if you agree that these uh, tactics don't work anymore. No, if you'd like to hear more context. I would I would love to pick this one content syndication because I saw somebody from our, our community asked about this. So if you can uh, share your thoughts about content syndication for lead gen and why it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. So um, I don't know, Andre. Maybe we can just put like actually try and find content syndication on some site and and just look at it and see what it is like that that would be interesting so if you want to just go into google usa and search something like i don't know best uh whatever the best marketing automation tools and see if like tech radar or something comes up let's see what do we have here like this maybe go to maybe skip maybe skip HubSpot because they don't do syndicated stuff. Maybe G two has some syndicated stuff in here, or yeah. maybe this is just a listicle page. Yeah, so it's kind of this. This might just be a listicle page, but um, so I don't think you're gonna find any syndicated content in here. But if you go to say Tech Radar, I know they're the kings of this. Yeah, let's do it. And I don't mean to pick on them. I just want to show you guys an example. Yeah, so go into that. What is marketing automation or even that best content marketing tools? Either one. Now let's see. All right, so you see the side. There's some ads. Yeah, of course. Um, just that cool. SEM rush. <laughs> that's not necessarily syndicated content. But let's see if there's some, maybe something on the side there that's like a, um, no, yeah, maybe nothing in there, but anyway, the point that you guys, um, that I want to make to you guys is essentially that it will be a site like this that has like some display ad that links you to like some kind of ebook. And that what needs to happen is you need to click on, on the display ad within some content like this and download the content. And then that content um, that you downloaded, you will give up your information in order to get that content. And then that contact information will be shared with the vendor that is doing the content syndication. So it would be on some kind of site like this um, and so basically the point that I'm making is that imagine if you are searching around Google and you land on a site like tech radar and you, um, and you're trying to actually like read like an article or something and try and find some information. I don't know what the chances are of you clicking on one of those ads and downloading some gated content from that. Um, I, I just, I, I personally never do it. I, who knows if it works maybe in some very niche or outlier based industries, but for, for, for sales and marketing, I don't believe that it works. What I will say though, is that um, I've, I've, I've been working with like some very technical companies lately. Um, some in the, in the, um, in the industry of like say graph databases and relational databases, believe it or not, technical white papers are still a thing and still are a big deal and matter for like those very, very niche technical communities but I will say that for the majority of the things that are like much more mainstream, like say B2B sales and marketing and demand gen, 
uh, those tactics died a while ago. Yeah, totally agree with you. So I, I saw the same, and some niches, it still works, and in very conservative markets, let's say, HVAC market, you are target engineers, and they love to read the specifications, technical content, etc. But in most cases, I have the same. I'm just uh, actually I wrote post today. Uh, so far, when we launched FullFunnel.io, we ran over seventy marketing and sales audits. And just believe me, like the majority of our clients use this tactic, and this never worked. I mean, mm -hmm. just the results are miserable. I mean, there mm. are some leads or opportunities. Yeah, but the cost of acquisition is really high and the sales cycle is very long. I'm not saying, I mean, uh, these tactics exist because in some niches, they might still work, right? But now we're talking generally speaking, right? If we look over the market, I see that it just doesn't work anymore. So that was yes. a question from Sharon about fake personalization. <laughs> I know what <laughs> but would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So um on the fake personalization front, um what I have what I have seen a lot lately is kind of they they try to make it seem like the outreach is personalized, but it's it's not. So what that means is basically they will um add a couple of more uh, fields that can be tokenized or personalized to say things like your your current job title or um, something something else, right? Uh, so it's it's not it's not real personalization. And uh, one reason that I know that this happens is because um, you see my profile name Gaetano Nino. I have that because when people use automated tools, it says. Hey, Gaetano Nino. <laughs> and I <laughs> and I know that um, nobody would normally speak that way if they weren't automating something. And so um, I can kind of just tell when something is like being faked or trying to be automated at mass scale. Um, I would say that in today's world, uh, the more you try and scale and automate, the less chances you have of being successful. Um, maybe some audiences are easily fooled, like say if you are doing working uh, in an industry that sells to HR executives, They're, they tend to be less savvy, so maybe it will work on them. But if you're um, in, a, in, a, in an industry where you're marketing to um, very tech sophisticated people, I would, I would shy away from that. Uh, I would love to share one quick example. That's just my favorite one. I Please. Yeah, I usually never reply back to the cold outreach, but there is one specific case when I reply back. I am uh, I often get pitches from the podcast booking agencies and they reach out with the same scripts. Probably they, they read the same blogs and just copy and paste the scripts and they say, hey, so I just uh, saw your full funnel podcast. It's mind blown, love the content and especially loved episode number 27 with, I don't know, Chris Walker. And it just put an exact title of that episode is just because they are scraping it, putting it right into the copy and say, so that was a perfect one. And I would love to pitch a guest who is right, a good fit, can talk about demand gen or whatever. So then I'm always replying back. So what was the most valuable part of that episode? And people never reply back. That, that, is, that is hilarious. There's there's a, um, the, I don't know if you guys know the rapper, uh, The Baby. Yeah, but he's he's a famous rapper in the U.S. And um, some dude went up to him like while he was in like his Escalade, like getting ready to go somewhere, and he was like, "Yo, the baby, you're you're my favorite rapper, man. You're the best. Can I get a picture with you, man?" And he's like, "Oh, I I'm your favorite rapper." He's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." And he's like, "All right, what's your favorite song?" And the guy's like, "Uh, <laughs> he couldn't <laughs> even name one song." And he's like, "Yo, get out of here, man." <laughs> um. But uh, Andre, I did want to I did want to follow up on one thing regarding the uh, content syndication. Yeah, let's. Um, do am I able to share a screen really quick? Uh, just a second. I will All right. stop sharing, and now you can. All right. Let me let me show you guys something because uh, 
who put all right sam morris put softwaretrends.com into the chat so um i want to i want to talk about this for a moment because i think it is important can you guys see this ahf screen right here yep all right so a site like softwaretrends.com when you see it just like can you guys see this yes all right let me x this out all right, so when you go to softwaretrends.com, you see it and you're like, all right, this seems like a pretty decent software review site, you know, like, yeah, it looks, it looks pretty credible. It looks decent. You know, they have, um, you know, recent content, whatever. Um, I'm going to go to their categories. All right, I guess I need to accept their stupid cookie thing. All right. So I'll go to their categories, find a topic. They have a lot of topics. So without anyone investigating further, how do you know if this, because you're going to get, you're going to get people from this company reaching out to you saying, Hey, would you like to increase your audience uh, visibility? Would you like to expand your reach across our engaged users? Would you like to do advertising with us? That's basically what, what they're getting at. They make money by companies like this, you know, paying for having a featured trend report right here. Okay. So the question then becomes, how do you know if this is a good company or not to work with? How do you know if they have good reach themselves? How do you know if what they're promising you is worth anything? Because there's a lot of companies like this that just come up with some domain, you know, some pretty cheesy looking logo, right? Um, they have products, resources, you know, and it look, at face value, it looks decent. Now, the, 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 uh, uh, to the untrained marketer eye, they might consider something like this. And the way these companies make money is they send thousands of emails a month to B2B marketers and eventually somewhere, someone will bite on it, right? Someone is obviously paying them for even this report right here. So this is, this is syndicated sponsored content, download now. Who, I don't even know who, what company is sponsoring this, but it's an HR industry thing. And actually um, they didn't make me give up my content uh, my contact information to download that. But what I want to show you guys though, is the reality of what kind of reach they have. So when you look at softwaretrends.com in a tool like Ahrefs, you can see that they barely get a thousand visits a month. They get about 900 estimated visits a month. And that is across all of their keywords. And the traffic value of their keyword set is very low, $700. And when you see who they compete with, <clears throat> there's no software review sites in here. It's just a bunch of weird stuff. <clears throat> if you see where their traffic comes from, 50% United States and then a bunch of other countries. And so when you look into their keyword set, we can see the kinds of things that they like rank for that drive the most amount of traffic. You know, it's some things related to their um, brand. And then it's just like a bunch of like weird stuff, like the banker's checklist, you know, some related stuff here, like they probably did some, you know, project management tool reviews or something like that. But the reality is that they just don't get a lot of traffic for relevant stuff. And it's like not a very good site. But without people doing their homework to investigate and figure this out, they may fall blind to that, to that pitch, right? They may, they may say, yeah, let's, let's take a shot on it. Let's spend 5k and see what happens. But then you got to think about it. How do they, how do they promote? <laughs> they're going to tell you, yeah, we have a huge email list. We get a lot of traffic. We have a lot of social followers, whatever. Um, but you won't, you won't know that unless you go and investigate these sites um, with third-party tools to see what kind of content do they have? What kind of traffic do they have? You know, what is their overall visibility in a certain industry? And so you need to go that extra step uh, before even deciding if a content partner is, is worth working with. Thank you. So Let's keep the change in B2B and let's move to the modern B2B just to make sure that <laughs> we'll have enough insights in our 60 minutes. So guys, I would love to uh, quickly um, navigate you through these points and then just write down in a Zoom chat what are the most interesting points for you so we pick up them and discuss. So LinkedIn is your resume. CEO drives strategic narrative, not product marketing, fewer forum fields, uh, campaigns are launched within days, not months, executives taking control of their own personal brands, community building on podcasts. This is actually what we are doing right now. 
YouTube forums and social answers, marketing comments on threads, Reddit, Slack, copywriting for customers, not VCs, live chat with lightning fast human response, live hangouts, partnerships, influencer marketing, video advertising, ungated content with an effective distribution strategy. This is something that I would definitely love to discuss. Long tail pain point SEO instead of what is, I don't know, account based marketing demand gen, gift into strengths and relationship, price and transparency, self service product tours, learn your skills on your own. So, what would you like to pick up? Um, CEO drives strategic narrative. What does it mean? Yeah. So, um... What, what I have experienced in my time um, in B2B marketing is that when, whenever like product marketing or product teams, whenever they try to come up with like angles for positioning and stuff like that, it's, it's, it's way too either like way too producty or salesy, or it's, it's way too much of a stretch. It's way too, um, it's way too far away from reality. And so you, I, from my experience, there's really the best person to tie it all together is the CEO because the CEO has a futuristic vision, but knows how to express it in a way that's realistic. And so I think when it comes to like the strategic narrative of your company, it does need to be led from the CEO in a collaboration with product team, product marketing, even demand gen and corporate communications, right? Um, I think you need to have that collaborative process in order to make it a really strong strategic narrative, but it, it needs to really be derived mostly from customer insights and audience research. So what you don't want is just the CEO just you know bulldozing what he or she believes should happen. Um, so it should start with customer insights and audience research bounce that off of product marketing and product team and, and let them get a sense of like, all right, this is how the product is resonating among our target audience. And this is what specific people who are customers and non-customers have said. Then let CEO and corporate marketing team and communications team kind of derive all that stuff and, and sift through it and look through it and then come up with some themes to, to test against and, and drive. But um, what I have seen far too often is just product marketing and product team saying, Hey, here's our vision. We need to go and push this CEO, maybe sprinkling a little bit of his or her own, you know, flavors into that. And then just going with it. Whereas like, you know, <laughs> the, the, this unfortunately can cause quite a disconnect between how companies see themselves and want to push their message versus like, what is reality? And so that is what I meant by that point. Thank you. Um, Emily, would you like to join us live and share your experience being a product manager? That would be fantastic. Let me know. Like. Yeah, just, just as I said, it's um, the product, um, product marketer or product manager can get really hung up um, in their own view of you know, what the, the product can do, um, the, the problem that it solves. But if it's not, uh, the message is not being entirely market driven, then it's completely biased. Um, and I do agree that the CEO needs to kind of interpret then the message that's going to be put back for, to the market. Um, and of course, communicated by the PM because they, they do know um, how their audience wants to receive it. Thank you. Yeah, very well said. Andre, I mean, if you wanna pull up some examples of, of some of this in, in practice, we can do it like real quick for a minute or two. Yeah, you can go to, you, you, yeah, you can go to nextiva.com. Um, do you want and, me to do it on LinkedIn? Or? Uh, no, you can go right to their homepage. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, if you guys, in, if you guys could please do me a favor without Andre even clicking around or scrolling, can you guys type into the chat what you think this company does? Like, what do you think is the primary thing that they do? If I could just get a couple of people to type that in. <laughs> and then while, while that's happening, um, Andre, if you wanna um, go to a different company on the second tab, 
Let's go to open phone. This one. Open phone. Uh, phone, P-H-O-N-E. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, you can go to their homepage. <clears throat> All right. So everyone, look at, look at the chat. All right, let's go back to Nextiva. Everyone said Slack, communications, communication all in one CRM, makes business communication easy. These companies, they do the exact same thing. Nextiva is a cloud phone company. Voice over IP cloud phone system is their, is their primary flagship product. That's, that's, that's the thing that 90% of their customers go to them for and find them for. But why is it that the homepage is so far away from phone? I mean, Andre, if you can scroll through the homepage, you can see there's if essentially no message, no mentions of phone, really. Yeah, I mean, you, exactly. it's like so far away from phone, right? Like people on this on this Slack, uh, people on this uh, on this Zoom couldn't even find out what it is that what it is that they do. Yeah, record meetings, calendar, file management. File management. <laughs> So you see how the positioning is just so far off from reality. Then if you go to open phone, yeah, this is what I'm talking about. The all-in-one phone system for teams, right? So th they're going about this in a much smarter way. They're, first of all, they're not afraid to say what it is that they do. They're not afraid to say who it is that they're doing it for. Um, now, if you scroll through this homepage, you'll see how they have the mobile phone image right there. So, yeah. and it's kind of popping out a little more. So you see that it is a suite of other things that they can offer you, but it's, it's primarily led by phone. So they're, they're, they're much more clear in what it is that they do and how they're going about explaining it. Yeah. That's a perfect example. That, that is the, that is the, that is the most perfect example ever. And yes, I, I did work for Nextiva. <laughs> so I am picking on them a little bit because I, I, this is one of the things I fought them on tooth and nail. Like every day it was a battle, Like guys, we are just, I get that you want to be futuristic and you want to, you know, show that you're more than just a phone system, but we are just way too far apart from reality at this point. Like we service, you know, mostly small businesses that need help, you know, with, with a, with a better way to just manage their phone calls. Like that's it. You know, so, you know, I understand the importance of being futuristic and being visionary, but how do we balance that with being realistic? And this is just too far apart. And so <laughs> Bruce said, explains why you left. Yeah. And so like, this is a great example of what happens when like, you don't, um, you don't have that, um, like feedback loop with customers and your audience. And it's just people internally pushing what they believe should happen, you know, um, it, it, in my view, this is just too far apart from reality. Yeah, absolutely. So let's pick up one more topic from here, from the list, and it was the uh, where it is the ungated content with an effective distribution strategy. So I would love to hear your thoughts about ungated. Uh, first of all, about the content distribution. Sure, man. So <clears throat> we can use Nextiva as another example, but. It was hard to distribute content other than search because of the nature of the subject matter. So when you're when you're in a really boring industry um, like voice over IP and cloud phone, where people view you as um, they view you like a utility company, they don't see you as an, an interesting software company like they're trying to be they more or less just view you as like, yeah, you're my phone provider. And so um, I expect you to work just like my internet provider, just like my electricity company. You need to be working all the time with no service interruptions. And that's basically it. When you have, when, when you're, when you're producing that type of content strategy about like cloud phones and all sorts of technical other stuff, the primary way that people would find us is through YouTube search and through Google search. And so we made basically a conscious decision to go all in on, on that and say, look, why try to figure out social distribution and, you know, all these other content syndication and webinars and podcasts, you know, why try and do all that 
when all the company really cares about is, is pipeline. And so let's just focus on bottom of funnel and, and there's enough demand to be captured out there where this is all we're going to focus on. And so um, I had to actually, for the four years I was at that company, just accept reality. And, and the reality I had to accept was this company doesn't really care much about like brand and going up funnel too much. They just want to capture as much demand out there as possible for all these things that they offer. And so let me just worry about my distribution being uh, search, let people find us in search. And that's the distribution. That's all I can do. That's all I can worry about. Cause this is all the company cares about. And sometimes you have to fight yourself internally and say, all right, if this is all the company cares about, this is what they hired me to do. Let me just get really good at that. And let me just do it. And so that is one angle to, to think about, um, if you're at that kind of company, let me pause there and allow for reaction. Has anyone else had that experience? <laughs> Share with us guys your experience. Meanwhile, Jasmine, feel free to jump in. You have a really interesting question. Hey, yes. Sorry. So this is actually something um, that you know I've struggled with. Um, big enterprise companies. Um, you know, also struggled with some startup clients that I work with. But you know, how do you justify the cost of creating that ungated content? You know, to really. Um, I guess, create the demand if you don't have the insights or like information from a certain target audience to really measure, gauge the interest and in how or if it's resonating. Sure, that is, that is a great, great question. Um, I will share my screen and just take you through some examples if that's all right. And let's see if I can get you the answer that you're looking for, <laughs> if that sounds good to you, uh, Jasmine. Yeah, sorry. I know there were like multiple pieces to that question. Yeah, yeah, there, there are multiple pieces to it for sure. All right, so let's let's start off with an example, okay? I'm going to share my screen and we're just going to spitball through this and uh, we're just going to see where we end up here. All right, so um, here is a company called ArangoDB. And let's take a look at their site. They have a homepage here that has a lot of things happening. So they have read about graph and beyond. So they're in graph database and relational databases. And it's a very complex backend systems thing where they sell to uh, systems engineers and system architects and things like that. They are promoting a white paper on their homepage about graph databases and beyond, All right? So the subject matter is learn about how graph databases can benefit your use case and so forth. The argument I would make is the following. I would go into, into a keyword tool and I would search for graph database. And I would say, wow, there is almost 6,000 searches a month around graph database, okay? I would go into Google and I would look at graph database. Oops. And I would say, wow, our top competitor is number one with no ads educating the market about graph databases. They have a fully loaded page here that is ungated with great content, with YouTube pushing their brand, why graph databases, graph model, right? Like all these things that are probably the same things you would find in this, in this white paper. This white paper probably has all that same information. Now, why would you wanna block people from learning about this? Why would you wanna, why wouldn't you just wanna be like Neo4j? and get all that traffic. We already saw there's 6,000 searches a month for this. Why wouldn't you wanna just be the first thing that people find, you know? And now let's, let's go look at something else. Neo4j, let's look at their brand traffic. 14,000 brand searches a month. Let's go to ArangoDB. 1,500 brand searches a month. So the company that is doing a more open content marketing style tends to have 
you know, four to five times more brand visibility in search than companies that are blocking people from getting that information. And so these guys have figured out it's better to give this information away, retarget them through cookies and market to them that way, rather than blocking, because you don't see a rango in any of these, um, in any of these searches, they're not being found. So then if you're Arango, how do you get people to go to your site? How do you even get them to download that white paper? Well, they have to go through these drop downs and try and find it somewhere, or they have to click on it from the homepage. But this to me is a, is a bit of a messy strategy. This, a lot of dots have to be connected you know, in, order to, in order to make this work. And so um, that is maybe the best example, Jasmine, I could give you. Um, that's the way I would go about it. I would say, look, we're we're losing on all this visibility and traffic because we're doing it, you know, the old way. Um, th that is the way that I would go about um, evaluating this. I don't know if that answers your question or is helpful, but that's the way I would go about it. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Thanks. I have a few more questions, not few. We have still lots of questions from our community. Just want to make sure that we cover it for people who uh, couldn't attend the um, episode live. Uh, but before I will ask these questions, uh, guys, let me know how valuable is this episode for you? How do you like it so far? Let me know in the podcast, uh, sorry, in the podcast, in the Zoom chat. Um, is it good? Yeah, is it great? Share with us your feedback, please. And if you like the episode, uh, I just dropped the link to our Spotify, uh, to our podcast on Spotify, so you can um, sign up. I would love to give also five cents on the gated content. And I think that lots of people mess the idea of gated content. So, so far, lots of B2B companies I've been working with think about gated content as a legion tactic. And it isn't a legion tactic. So if you, I know probably some of you will tell, hey, but we still have these eBooks and then our SDR gets in touch and books demo calls. Some of you might tell me that this works, but again, I share it with you an example. So I analyzed, I did like so far over seven, 70 marketing and sales audits and I have never seen this tactic work successfully. Why? Because it's not really hard for people to book a demo call if they're interested, right? If there is a demand for your product, they just go to, they are already on your website, right? What's the problem of clicking on book a demo call or find a calendar or DM, uh, SDR or whatever, right? Or write a message in a live chat, hey, I want just to check the product. So if they sign up, or if they download the ebook, it's not buying intent, it's just curiosity. So they're interested in the content and I totally agree with Gaetano. So that part should be ungated. That being said, just to give you an example, right? So we're hosting this episode live. And you still need it to sign up. It's gated content, but in what way it's gated, right? You need to get the reminders. You need to get basically invite from my calendar to join this meeting and get the Zoom link, right? And I'm not going to spam you with whatever. Hey, guys, uh, just go to my website and book a demo call with me. That's not the point at all, right? But I would send you invites to the uh, next events because like in the past, some of you attended last week, we had an episode with friend from Cognism and lots of you attended, right? So lots of you are coming and coming and coming. And for me, that's ex exactly the goal. That being said, let's say what I love, self-paced email courses. We have a couple of them about account-based marketing, about B2B marketing strategy for companies with high ACV products. And the point of this course, you just get emails and you select you select the frequency, right? How often do you want to get? Do you want to get immediately all the units or do you want to get them one by one? And then you receive what we are doing with this newsletter after you're going through the email course, right? Every week you will get our best performing content that is already validated on LinkedIn content that 
received lots of positive feedback. And we just add meaty points to this, uh, I mean, to this post, right? Adding relevant links, for example, to episode like this one. And Obviously, at the end of the email, we have a very soft call to action saying, hey, so it's just, you know, the last point. If you are interested, this is what our company is doing. Learn more here, right? And this is this is what I call by nurturing. So for some of you, you might not be interested in, at all in our services. That's absolutely fine. But if you find our content valuable, there are high chances that you will share it on social. You will share it with your peers, right? And that's the point we are pursuing with the gated content. And I think that's a huge mess. Lots of companies still don't understand. Unfortunately, the buying process is not linear. I, I hear some of uh, some of you saying, hey, this works, but it just the point is let's look at numbers, right? And uh, for how long you are maintaining these tactics and how do you define the lead? For me, probably you disagree with me, but for me, the lead is a person or a contact who is interested in your service, a person who has a need, has a budget and wants to talk to you. And basically this person already knows that your product solves a specific challenge this person has. This is lead for me, not a person who came for this podcast episode to listen to our chat with Gaetana, hanging out with peers and um, chatting and meeting new people, right? Imagine if I would send the list of people so far we have 40 people online, 100, 190 people sign up for this episode. Imagine if I will send this list to my co-founder a lot and saying, hey, you know what? We have 190 people sign up for this podcast. So tomorrow you need to pitch all of them on LinkedIn saying you guys attended the chat between Andre and Gaetano. Would you be interested in B2B demand gen services? So what would be- <laughs> yeah, your or, even, or even worse, giving me the list. And I will, <laughs> I will pitch all of you, you know, um, I, I don't know. I don't like to work that way. I would rather you just reach out to me. If you, if you, the thing that's the, that's the whole point of this, when people are ready and they, they are, you know, serious, they will reach out when the time comes. And so, uh, you need to just have that patience, unfortunately, in, in most cases, but <clears throat> there was one thing I think would be interesting to close off on Andre. And it's the story of the pizzeria marketing from Rand Fishkin that he shared. And I think this will be valuable to a lot of people. Uh, it's a good one, a good note to close out on. So, so um, yeah, Alan says it's sad that I have all these things going on in my company right now. Yeah, sorry, man. I, <laughs> well, I wish I could help you with that, <laughs> but all I can do is share horror stories from here and let you, you know, maybe find some silver lining in it. But the pizzeria marketing story from Rand Fishkin. This is this is what happened. There was a pizzeria. And the pizzeria needed to increase leads and it needed to increase customers. So the pizzeria had an idea to give flyers with discounts to a bunch of uh, territory managers who would go out onto the streets and promote the pizzeria. And um, the promoters would get credit for the people that they brought in to the pizzeria to buy food. One really slick person figured out that he or she could game the system by just hiding behind the corner of the pizzeria and watching all the people that were about to walk in and buy something anyway and give them a flyer so that he would get credit for it. And a lot of what is happening in B2B marketing is kind of like this. If you, if you do all these webinars and, <clears throat> and uh, white papers and gated content and stuff, and someone ends up buying, do you think that it was the webinar or the, or the gated content that caused them to want to buy? Do you think that's what caused them to suddenly switch from a non-buying mode to a buying mode? Or do you think that it was going to happen anyway. They were already in a buying mode and they were just checking out your stuff because it's there and it's on the way to a purchase. And so what you need to avoid in, in, in marketing is this idea of like a fault of, of um, reporting on false positives. 
you don't want to be saying that, yes, it's because these things that we're doing suddenly caused people to switch into a buying mode and change their mind. And, you know, that's why we're having success. It's likely the case that they were already going to buy anyway. And so um, that, that is why attribution is so messed up in, in B2B sales and marketing, because there are a lot of things that might happen that get consumed by people who are going to buy anyway. And so that is, I think, an interesting point to close off on. Andre, I know a lot of advertising can, can, can do this as well, but do you have any perspective on this or, or any, um, any examples that are similar to the one I shared? Uh, I would say, you know what, I'm seeing this, um, I'm just always saying it all comes from linear mindset. So people want to have this, they want to attribute everything and they have this, lots of B2B companies have product and scalability obsession. I would just generalize here, right? And they want to find these channels where they can put more dollars in and get more dollars out, right? So I even, I will give you a very good example that pumped up recently in our community. So that was a post by my co-founder about LinkedIn thought leadership. And then the guy asked a question, uh, tagging me and asking a question like, hey, uh, so I'm kind of want to launch this thought leadership program and involving our executives, something that you also shared, right? In your post that executives should be the first phase talking and leading the narrative, etc. cetera. Um, and the only one thing I'm struggling with, if let's say how to make a forecast, if I will make 10 posts and get one inbound opportunity from these 10 posts, does it mean that if I will make 20, if I will publish 20 posts, I will give, I will get two opportunities. Can I make this forecast? And I'm saying, no, 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 hold on. So that's that's a huge problem. Exactly what what you are saying. So companies want to measure everything. Exactly like I know Chris Walker talking a lot about his podcast, saying that like podcast is the number one source of opportunities, but you'll never see it. I posted recently. I analyzed all of our deals and opportunities for fullfunnel.io. Ninety-one percent of opportunities are saying that they are following me and Vlad. And the most important thing, the most interesting thing, that most of these people never engage with our content. I mean, actively not like and not leaving comments. They are so-called lurkers, right? But then occasionally you get an inbound message or they book a call and they fill in the form. We have what Gaetano said in the post, how did you hear about us? And they say, hey, so we are following your content for a while. Uh, our marketer is in your trenches community. We, are, we have attended some of your full funnel live podcast episodes, et cetera. But can, be this, can this be attributed in our software? No way. And that's just basically given some practical probably examples. Love it, man. Well, well, thank you for having me. And uh, to everybody on the call, thank you again. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here and talk shop about B2B marketing. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, guys, for the questions that we didn't ask, I would follow these questions to Gaetana and just ask maybe to record a short video or whatever, provide the text answers to your questions and then email you as well. Thanks a lot for attending. Thanks a lot for great engagement and great questions. And see you next week. We are going to talk about the full funnel B2B marketing strategy. Have a great yeah. rest of the week. Cheers. Thanks, guys. You can hit me up anytime. Peace out.